Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit from the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the word of the world gives. Do not let our hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You hear me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may, you may believe. Praise God for the hearing of these sacred words. Well, as I said just moments ago, today is Heritage Sunday. It's Confirmation Sunday. It's a Sunday in which we have a new uh, announcement of a pastoral appointment. And even after um, I finish my sermon today, we're going to have a baby dedication. We're going to cover all of our bases um, today as Methodist Temple. The picture you're looking at um, has to do with our Heritage Sunday, though. That's the picture of the very first uh, worship service that was ever held here at Methodist Temple in 1950. That's when we opened here on the extreme, what was the extreme east side of Evansville at that time in 1950. Uh, if you kept going east, you found uh, country, and you found uh, Green River Road was a country road. And so this was the, uh, the congregation. We had about 800 people uh, show up at that first worship service. And so we, we celebrate our, our heritage today as Methodist Temple. Um, as we do get started, let's begin with a moment of prayer, though. Would you pray with me? God, on this day, I do ask that you would help us to continue to be present to you, even as you're here, both present with and within each of us. God, on this day, I do ask that you would take the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, and that you would move and work in such a way that they would be made to be acceptable in your sight, for indeed, you are our rock, and you are our redeemer. Amen. So it's Heritage Sunday. It's Confirmation Sunday. It's a Sunday when we had a, a new pastoral appointment, a new associate pastor appointed here at our church. But it's one other day today. Um, it's Aldersgate Sunday. Now, if you're a longtime Methodist, do you know what Aldersgate is? Anyone? Crickets? Anyone? I got a couple thumbs up. Aldersgate um, is the day in which John Wesley, the founder of our movement, uh, had an experience with the love of God in which his heart was strangely warmed and his life was transformed. Legend has it in Methodism. It was on May the 24th, 1738, that John Wesley showed up to a small group meeting on Aldersgate Street in England, and he felt his heart strangely warm and his life was transformed by the grace and the love of God. Now, here's my bad joke because I always have one in my back pocket. So here we go. So John Wesley's heart was strangely warm on May the 24th, 1738. Uh, my wife Leslie's heart was also strangely warmed on May the 24th, 2008, because that was the day she married me. So, yeah. I remembered. I remembered. So, and to be clear for the record, Leslie's heart was strangely warmed and my heart was strangely warmed too. And it's just, it's just like a fire that's kindled and burning now, right, honey? So, no, so I love you less, and I remembered. So I'm throw that in there. I remember it again. So, yeah, so. So what's this Aldersgate thing all about? That's what I want to talk about today. Uh, what's this idea that you can feel the love of God and that you can experience God's love in your life? I mean, that's the question that we should all be asking as Christians. That is the question. How do we experience God's love, and how do we experience God's grace in our life? And part of it's a mystery, but, but part of it is that we have a tradition to teach us what that's like and how we can do that. And as Methodists, we have a wonderful tradition. I'm not saying our tradition is better than other traditions. I just love our tradition. And uh, if you really are going to understand the Methodist movement, the Methodist church, you have to go to John Wesley. I mean, you can't be in a Methodist church and not hear the name John Wesley being used um, from time to time. He was born in 1703. 
He was born in England, and so he was born before we were even a country, really. Uh, his parents uh, were both very devout. His father was an Anglican priest, Church of England priest. His mother, Susanna, um, was really the one that was in charge of raising John and his siblings. And um, growing up, John's mom was very devout. John became very devout. And he felt the call to ministry. He became an Anglican priest like his dad as well. And he was very, very committed to it. In fact, when he was in college in Oxford, he uh, had a little group of buddies, and they got together. They called it the Holy Club, and they got together. They prayed and, and uh, had Bible study and tried to do Christian-type things uh, because they wanted to be serious about the way they enacted their faith. By the time you get to 1735, though, um, John has graduated. He's now a priest, and he is compelled and sent to Georgia, the Georgia Territory, as a missionary. This is a pivotal time in his life. Um, it's a territory at that time because, again, it's 1735. There's no United States yet, right? So it's just a territory. Um, and John's all excited about going there because he feels like the Native Americans are just going to uh, receive the Christian message hook, line, and sinker. I mean, he just thinks it's, it's going to be awesome. And he's going to introduce them to what he calls primitive Christianity. Um, needless to say, it didn't go quite as planned. Um, he gets there, and the Native Americans are uh, perfectly fine with their own spirituality, and they weren't all that interested in what John had to say, and so he's pretty disappointed. While he's there, though, he falls in love. He falls in love with a, a poli local politician's daughter. Her name is Sophie Hopke. And uh, we're not really sure what happened, but John broke it off with her. And then Sophie moved on, and she got married to another guy, at which point John got very mad. And he publicly accused her of sin, and then would not, serve her, would not serve her Holy Communion. And in modern terms, friends, that's what we call an overreaction, is what that is. That's an overreaction. And uh, basically, John gets ran out of town. And he has to get on a ship and go back to England. His heart is broken. He's disappointed. He's questioning his faith. And as they're on that ship going back to England, there's a great storm. The ship is about ready to sink. And John looks across the ship, and there's another group of Christians. They are called Moravians. And he saw that the Moravians had peace in the midst of that storm that was about to sink that ship. And he saw that they had contentment, and they were at ease. And he didn't have it. And he was afraid. The ship lands in England, and he's searching. He finally, it's now the year 1738, and he finally ends up going in his journal it says very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street have you ever gone unwillingly to church this is church you have to tell the truth so John went very unwillingly to a, a little small group meeting um, in Aldersgate Aldersgate Street and they were reading about uh, Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans and how we're saved by grace alone not by our works we're made right in our relationship with God not by what we do and don't do but by God's love, and he feels God's love move in his life. And his heart's strangely warmed, and he's transformed. There's one Methodist theologian, I think he said it best. He said, in this moment, John Wesley's passion for religion was transformed to compassion for people. And that makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? I mean, we all know some people who are pretty passionate about their religion. I mean, if you're like me, you want to run for the hills when you get around folks like that. When are you going to cross the line? When are you going to offend them? When are you not going to fit in their box? That's the kind of questions you ask when you're around folks like that. And we also know some people who are passionate and compassionate about people. They're contagious in a good way. And John Wesley's life was transformed in that way, and his life burned with the love of God that, that led to a love of people. It led him to working for prisoner reforms, prison reforms in his day. It led him to allowing women to be in leadership in his day. It led him to standing against slavery in his day. It led him, even when the Church of England wouldn't let him preach in their pulpits anymore, they got all upset with him and his other, his other buddies because they were so passionate. They didn't want that kind of stuff in their churches. So they kicked him out and they wouldn't let him preach in the church. And so he, of all things, started to take his show on the road in his first outdoor sermon he ever preached, he stood on his father's tomb, on Samuel's tomb, and he preached. 
That, in modern terms, is called intense, is what that is, folks. He's intense. By the end of his life, the United States was beginning to be created. They weren't having bishops come quickly enough to the, the new world, the United States. So John takes matters in his own hands. He ordains two people, uh, Thomas Coke, Francis Asbury, and American Methodism was born. It's, your, it's around the year 1790. And so what does it mean, though? How do we find this that he found? How do we look for this that he, he was looking for? What do we do? Because we all deep down want to have compassion for people, and we deep down all want to love God and love people and burn with that type of love. We all want that. And if we're really honest in our heart of hearts, we know that voice, and we know deep down that's true. So how do we find that? And John had three words when it came to finding God's love in our life. First, repentance. Second, faith. Third, holiness. These are old words, I know, but they're good words. They're good words. Repentance, that's a word that has a lot of baggage. I know. Moralistic repentance. A lot of times we hear the word, we think about not measuring up, shame, guilt, these kinds of things. But when John used the word, repentance was about knowing yourself. Knowing yourself which is odd, I know. I mean, that, when I first heard that, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. That doesn't make any sense to me. Know yourself. If you ask someone in our world today who they are, and they're going to tell you uh, who they are in relationship to other people. That's how we know ourselves today, right? You ask someone who they are today, and typically they're going to tell you one of three things. They're going to tell you what they do. They're going to tell you what they have. And they're going to tell you what, what other people think about them, what groups they belong to. We know ourselves in relationship to other people. And what that has led to is a world filled with fear and anger and anxiety. Because when we find our identity from other people, we're fearful that they're not going to love us back. We're, we're anxious that we're not going to measure up. And we're angry because folks have not loved us in the way that we believe we should be loved. When John said, know yourself, he wasn't talking about knowing yourself in relationship to other people, though. He's talking about knowing yourself in relationship to God. And who are we in relationship to God? We're made in the image of God. We're loved by God. Our truest self is the love of God. And we fall short. And we have issues. And we don't always love very well. And that's what it means to know yourself, to admit that. I don't always love well. I forget about God a lot. I don't treat people as I should. And maybe on the outside you do it well, but on the inside we don't do it well, if you're really honest. And it's so important we admit this. And the reason it's so important we admit this is because if we can't admit our own faults, if we can't acknowledge our own faults, if we can't acknowledge that we have issues, we're never going to have grace to other people who have issues too. The most dangerous person in the room is the one that refuses to admit they have any faults. Why? Because they're going to come across self-righteous, judgmental. They're going to put people down, and they're going to feel justified in the harm that they do to others. Know yourself. That's repentance. The second one's faith. So the first one says, I have issues. The second one says, yes, but God loves me anyway. When we say faith is Methodist, what we're saying is God's forgiven our sin anyway. And specifically, it's manifested on the cross. And John Wesley never really articulated what we call atonement theology. When he talked about the cross, he never really articulated how how Jesus' death got our forgiveness. He never really said that clearly. But let me just say this about it. On the cross, we as Wesleyans and Methodists believe it's not that God's wrath was satisfied. It's that God's love is magnified. And that makes all the difference in the world. And so we believe in the forgiveness of sin. And we believe that God loves us anyway in the midst of our issues. Which leads to the last word, holiness. What's that? Well, holiness is all about obedience. And what's that? It's not about measuring up. It's not about earning it. It's not about making sure that you don't 
say something, do something, not say something, not do something you shouldn't do, and then you lose your salvation immediately. It's not like that at all. Holiness is about obedience, and obedience is about listening. Listening. And what are we listening to? We're listening to the voice of God's love that's speaking in the depths of each and every one of our hearts. As we dial into that, and as we tune into that, we begin to feel God's love. Our hearts begin to become strangely warmed. So a few weeks ago, I was interviewing a, what we call a licensed local pastor. That's one of the great things I get to do because I am ordained. I have to interview all the part-time pastors in our area. It's, it's a, an accountability type of thing. There are long meetings. There are long meetings. I was talking to a young clergy that just got started, and one of the questions we have to ask is, tell us about your Methodist theology. I know, that's a great way to start, great way to start a conversation, right? Tell us about your theology. I mean, nothing really gets it, anyway, gets things started like that. The young man said, I'm so glad you asked that question. Here's my favorite John Wesley quote, and I'm like, woo, coming in hot, man. <laughs> Ordain you on the spot. He says, my favorite John Wesley quote is this. Someone asked John Wesley once what his secret was. And he said, ah, I just invite the, the Holy Spirit to light me on fire, and then people come watch me burn. People come watch me burn. And I pray and I hope that we as the Methodist Church, we burn with a lot of things these days. But I hope we burn more than anything else with the love of God that leads to a love of people. Not a passion for religion. Lord knows we don't need more of that. Compassion. Compassion for people. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. That's what it means to be the church. And that's why I still love Methodism. Because this is who we are at our core. This is our heritage to seek to be perfected in love. I can go on and on. I'm going to pump the brakes now. But just know that you are loved, loved by God. Listen to that voice. And today we're going to celebrate that voice now as the Han family comes.